Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got a very interesting Mesmer video from a man made out of potatoes. And then we've got a roundtable discussion on Guild Wars 1, the legacy of Guild Wars. Stay tuned. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network. You can check us out at talesoftyria.com. You can also check us out at the Sound Strategy Network channel on youtube.com. Uh, we are live from the great free city of Lion's Arch, the Rosewind Tavern, as it were. We've got a great show in store for you today. Thank everybody, uh, thank you guys for joining us and... Um, Tell somebody else about the show, if you wouldn't mind. Tell it how awesome it is. Give us some feedback. Feedback at TalesOfTyria.com. Tell us why it's great, why it sucks, what you'd rather see us be talking about. We want to hear from you. Let's move into the introductions. I am Bridger, also known as Adam Ruzo, and I'll be your host for this evening. And joining me, as always, we have my good friend, Freelancer, from Team Legacy. Welcome, sir. Hey, how's it going, Bridger? Not bad. How have you been? Uh been busy we'll just word it like that <laughs> <laughs> that's one way to put it welcome back we didn't yeah. have you on last week good to see you again also joining us we have uh mr vega who is on a different channel there we go welcome jay hello good evening how's it going good 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 and joining us as well we have a special guest today malchior hello sir how you doing thanks for joining us he is going to be our resident Guild Wars 1 expert, because none of us here really played it nearly as heavily as we have played other games, and so we did not feel competent talking about it without someone to set us straight <laughs> and tell us where we're wrong. Um, so, I'll do my best. <laughs> so what have you guys been doing? Anybody do anything interesting le le lately? Any, any games that you've been playing that have been, you know, really awesome you want to talk about? Any good stories? Um... I've been playing Dota 2. I don't know if anyone's really? a Dota fan. Oh, you yes. got in the Dota 2 beta. How's it, it playing? Um, yes. Um, it's great. I, Valve, uh, I mean, you know, it still has little bugs here and there, but Valve did a really good job so far. I haven't really um, been following it. Is it a simple graphics upgrade for Dota 1, or did they change the gameplay at all? No, it's the same, same basic gameplay. Um, same heroes. Uh, I was just wondering it's... if they gave it the Valve treatment or if they just said, okay, well, we're going to keep it exactly the same. <laughs> well, they definitely gave the Valve treatment in that characters actually have character and the way that they, like all the dialogue, like I, every character has hours of dialogue with just these little oh, wow. snippets. That, that, that was one thing I loved about TF2 was the heavy weapons oh, guy and yes. all the crap he would just be oh, yelling yeah. at you. And so it's really, well game. it's really great in that sense because that's what they've done in Dota 2. And... Yeah, I just, I mean, the graphics itself, it's not, it's a little more than a simple graphical upgrade. It's, okay. a, it's a really great looking game. Excellent. I've been playing a lot of League of Legends myself, and I... I noticed that. It's, I it's, saw that. It's just as frustrating as I remember it was. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever get to max? No, oh, no, I'm at level 8. <laughs> I just started playing again. I played a little bit before, but anyway, let's get back to uh, Guild Wars 2. Uh, well, that is to say, uh, Guild Wars... <laughs> Uh, yeah. I had a vi I stumbled across a video that was uploaded last week by a gentleman by the name of Wooden Potatoes on YouTube. Some of you may have known him. He's or may know him rather. Uh, he is uh, do done a lot of lore related and let's play videos for Guild Wars One, and he had some very interesting things to say about the Mesmer and how the Mesmer is going to be adapted to Guild Wars Two. And he said it in such a fantastic way that I rather than just taking the words out of his mouth, I thought I'd just let him say it. So why don't we jump in and listen to Wooden Potatoes discussing the Mesmer Enigma for a couple minutes here.
There has been much speculation over the past year to do with the mysterious 8th final Guild Wars 2 profession. Owing to the fact we know it will be a returning caster class from Guild Wars 1, and the numerous hints dropped by ArenaNet employees over the months, it's pretty safe to say that it will be the Mesmer. So the real question is, how does the Mesmer fit into the new game? And this is where it gets interesting. The Guild Wars 1 Mesmer was a mind-altering manipulation class. They were, thematically, designed around the concept of breaking into your enemy's mind and altering their very perception of reality. A master of illusion, misdirection and control. To be a Mesmer meant to know the mind and capabilities of your enemies, and to know how best to turn those abilities against their owners. So the concept for the class was solid, but then came the much more difficult task of making the class play how it was described. In Guild Wars 1, the ability to interrupt enemies, to drain their energy, and to cast hexes were arguably the three biggest mechanics that made Mesmers feel like they could control people. And for the most part, this worked incredibly well. So why can't the Mesmer be the same in the sequel? For sure, it won't be hard for the Mesmer to thematically fit into Guild Wars 2. There's certainly space for such a profession. But in gameplay terms, it proves far more difficult to bring the Mesmer to Guild Wars 2. In the original game, hexes were debuffs that lasted a period of time and had varying effects. So for example, a Mesmer Hex backfire would cause an enemy to take significant damage if they cast any spells while affected by it. Much of the Mesmer's arsenal was made up of hexes like this one. All of them were designed to put pressure on opponents and manipulate them in various ways. In Guild Wars 2, however, there's no such thing as a hex. Rather than having hundreds of unique debuffs for players to learn about, Guild Wars 2 has a small selection of debuffs known as conditions. This makes the game far easier to pick up and play, but few, if any, conditions seem to fill the same niche Mesmer hexes did. Replacing these lost skills or making the old hexes work in the new game environment that uses conditions will be a big challenge. Interrupts in Guild Wars 1 were a core aspect of Mesmer gameplay. Being an instance game focused on smaller teams of players completing content, Guild Wars 1 was able to include many interrupt abilities. They could even have pretty liberal recharges without ever introducing the possibility of players becoming overpowered and permanently shutting down enemies. Guild Wars 2, however, is a true open MMO and isn't afforded that luxury. Interrupts have been heavily reduced in number and in power. They're still in the game, but ArenaNet argues that in order to stay balanced, they'll need far longer recharges and to be far less common. While Mesmers will still likely have some interrupts, this leaves another huge gap in their repertoire. Then there's the changes to the energy system. A huge part of being a Mesmer in Guild Wars 1 was draining your opponent's energy, the resource used to activate skills. This forced opponents to think a lot harder about which skills they could afford to use at which time, potentially causing them to slip up under the pressure and allow you to take the victory. Energy in Guild Wars 2 does not exist. All skills are balanced purely around their recharge rates and nothing else. While I feel this is a smart decision for the game, it does remove another core aspect from the Mesmer. So you'll find after all this, there's really very little else left. With the three main mechanisms by which the original Mesmer functioned removed from the picture, it becomes very interesting wondering what direction ArenaNet will take the new Mesmer in. People have suggested mind control or possession mechanics, illusionary summons, spells that interfere with opponent's UI, and, and pretty much everything else in between, but no suggestions so far seems foolproof. The cherry on this delicious mystery cake is found in the skills ArenaNet have given the other seven already announced professions. It's been established that in Guild Wars 2 each profession will feel unique and there will be very little overlap between the classes. So when the engineer is given a skill that looks uncannily like backfire, or it's given a skill that allows them to use other professions elites, or when the necromancer is revealed to be efficient in applying conditions and debuffs like fear, it's really easy to wonder what is actually left for the Mesmer. In the end, it's become harder and harder to predict how the Mesmer will work as time has gone on. So the question remains, when so much has changed between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2, how exactly does the Mesmer fit in? There we go, wooden potatoes. Little contribution segment there. I asked his permission before putting that on here, but that was actually something that he put together for YouTube, and I thought that was a very well done piece. I mean, he brings up a lot of really interesting questions. How do you build a Mesmer in Guild Wars 2 when you take out all of the Mesmer's main functions in Guild Wars 2? Uh, any thoughts, uh, Freelancer? What do you think? I know you were really looking forward to the Mesmer. Yes, I plan on rolling a Mesmer, assuming the Mesmer is in the game, which we can pretty much uh, be safe to say There's a that. lot of evidence pointing that way. Yeah, a lot of evidence. No proof yet. But yeah. uh, that may ch change very soon within the upcoming weeks, right? We hope so. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, the Mesmer seems like one of those classes that can make or break the whole PvP scene because in Guild Wars 1, um, didn't play it as much as Malkyr here, but um, it 
Mesmer was always the class that would shut me down as a player. I rolled Elementalist. I played Assassin for a little bit. It didn't matter what I did. I was always watching out for Mesmers, and their reputation spoke for themselves. Um, if Guild Wars 2 implements the Mesmer correctly, I'll be on top of it. I'm sure a lot of other people will, but they have to do it in a sense that doesn't dwarf the other classes. See, we're putting so much uh, attention on the Mesmer because you know everybody's talking about how that may be the new class, but that overshadows all i mean who talks about the guardian anymore who talks about uh any of these other classes i just hope they don't go so overboard with the mesmer that it dwarfs the other classes and you know makes them where they just seem like the other guys you know true <laughs> and I, I i always have loved the idea of somebody using illusions and other things like that to in, in a fight like you can cause somebody to see something that they can't see and then dance around behind them and slit their throat or whatever. So I've, I've always loved that concept of having an illusion magician style fighter. Uh, and, and I did play a little bit of the Mesmer in, in Guild Wars 1, but Malkyr, you played a lot of the, a lot of Guild Wars 1. Did you play a lot of Mesmer by any chance? Oh yes. The very first GVG build I adapted to within a team was the Energy Surge Mes Mesmer, which was entirely focused on um, armor-free, chaos damage, and energy control. So I'm very familiar with the mess with, yeah. What, do you think um, that, the, that Wooden Potatoes has it right here, that the Mesmer really has lost a lot of what it would have done in Guild Wars 2 just based on the mechanic decisions that they've made so far? Absolutely. So what, you see, what you see in Guild Wars 2 will not, it, in essence, it will not be a Mesmer because... Mechanics of Guild Wars 1, Guild Wars 1 is designed around this whole team role gameplay where in Guild Wars 2, everyone can do everything. So you can't have a core Mesmer within Guild Wars 2 because a profession that is primarily control can't do much of anything else. Those illusions you're talking about that might be physical for players to see... I can see those happening within the current Guild Wars 2 physics engine. The design of the Guild Wars 1 Mesmer is using hexes, which won't exist, as WP said, and energy control and denial to control the pace that you want the battle to flow or control the battle in the way you have it designed. Put empathy on the physical so they, deal, so they hurt themselves when they attack you. Backfire the spellcasters so they take damage every time they cast a spell. Interrupt this spell. Interrupt that spell. It's all about just dictating the opponent's play. And that can happen with every profession now. Every profession has a dodge mechanic. You can bait out their elite or you can bait out one of their key skills to dodge. It's not just a mechanic within the Mesmer anymore. I believe in Guild Wars 2 we're only going to see... Mesmer by name, just for its legacy. All right, that's that's uh, probably. I think it's very interesting I, that Mesmer became a sort of control shutdown hexing class, almost like the warlock in World of Warcraft, basically, as this sort of you know dots and and hexes and debuffs a lot, and and that does is is not what I think of when I think of the theme of the mesmer, the illusions and getting in your head kind of control thing, but um, that's certainly one direction to take it, but I think there's other directions that can be taken uh mechanically uh vega any any input from you from for, for as far as this uh, mesmer discussion yeah um mesmer mesmer was actually the first class I rolled in Guild Wars just because it ah. seemed so unique at the time um there's a lot of fun to play, but I, I think that everything that was said is definitely true in that the way that Guild Wars 2 is changing, a Mesmer in its essence isn't going to be a Mesmer in Guild Wars 2. But if you look at it from a broad perspective in that the Mesmer is all about controlling the opponent. You know, in Guild Wars 2, you have, you know, everyone could do everything, but it, it really if you look at it, like a Guardian can do everything, but a Guardian is to kind of control the space and put up walls and help, you know, mitigate damage. And some, someone like, um, it, 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 pretty much what I'm getting at is that every class can do everything, but every class is also, it kind of seems like it will excel in certain areas more than other classes. So I feel like the Mesmer will be that class that that's what their focus is. Their focus is controlling and trickery and illusions. 
Um, as to how they're going to do it, I really don't know. But it'd be nice to – I think that it's, it, it's going to be called a Mesmer, but for anyone who is really into Guild Wars 1, they might be disappointed that it's not exactly how a Mesmer was back then. Certainly. And I think a lot of the classes that have come from Guild Wars 1 to Guild Wars 2 have relatively stayed the same. I mean, the Elementalist is still, you know, sort of a nuking mage – the warrior is still the master of arms of all of these different weapon combinations that give them versatility and 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 that you know those kind of things haven't changed too much but it seems like the mesmer is probably going to be the one that has to change the most simply based upon the mechanics changes okay uh let's move on to then our discussion of the round table and the guild wars legacy so Again, the reason that I brought Malkior on here is because he has played a hell of a lot more Guild Wars 1 than any of us have. And I wanted combined. to get his insights. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's combined. Combined, probably, <laughs> yes. yes. 4,700 hours last I checked. Oh, snap. Oh, jeez. That sounds like me. I thought I played a lot of Left 4 Dead 2. I'm at like 300 hours. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I, I, I did look at my age uh, yesterday. When I was doing WP's Dungeon Run, and it's at 4,700. He's All playing right. right now while he's on the show. <laughs> that I am not. I do respect what is happening here. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let's, uh, let's talk about then what was Guild Wars 1 like? Because I'm sure there was a lot of people that may be in the audience that didn't play Guild, War Guild Wars 1. So let's talk about sort of the very brief overview because Guild Wars 1 was not – a World of Warcraft style MMO. It was quite different at, a t at the time. And to give you a very brief rundown of the major differences between Guild Wars 1 and some of the other ones, if you've ever played Magic the Gathering, I've always thought of Guild Wars 1 as, as Magic the Gathering the MMO. Because what essentially you were able to do is within each of the classes that you would pick, and you could dual class, and, and it's sort of like choosing two different types of, of mana in... in, uh, in um, in, in Magic, then each of those classes, your primary would give you more and better stuff, but your secondary would still give you some stuff from your secondary class, and then you'd get tons of different skills. Tons of skills. And you would be able to bring those into any situation, but only eight at a time. So you could have maybe a hundred skills available to you by the time you've you know maxed out and gotten all these different skills, but you have to bring eight of them into the game, and you want to find synergy between your own skills, but also synergy with your teammates' skills. And the screen went black because I hit the wrong button. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so the the real core of that game was okay. I'm uh, playing as a warrior, and I've got this skill that can cause my enemy to bleed. And my teammate's got a necromancer build, and he can do extra damage to opponents who are bleeding. So you can sort of look at the skills and build, quote-unquote, decks, if you think of it from the magic perspective, of things that will work and synergize with each other really well. So in a sort of eight versus eight, what was called the guild versus guild battles in PvP, you would have teams that would build around certain concepts, certain core concepts, and maybe this group would work together and that group would work together, and they'd build skills that were synergized with each other. And that's a very different take on the game, that, on, on MMOs in general, than many of the other ones that were out there. The other big thing that really changed, made it very different is that much of the out, you know, large world content was instanced, whereas uh, it's a sort of save on the server uh, costs, I would guess, because it, theoretically there was less going on, but I, I don't know the details. I would think that would be the case. And so It started with just three guys developing out of an apartment, so yeah, <laughs> I never considered it, so that might have been the key reason. That could be it, too. I mean, instanced has got to be easier to do because... I mean, we've been doing netcode for FPS games and RTS games with, you know, 8 to 10 people in them all the time. So, or even 64, I mean, as, 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 long, as long ago as Tribes 1. So the, the real problem is getting that, you know, thousands of people in the same situation, in the same server, same area, things like that. So anyway, that's sort of the quick overview of what made Guild Wars 1 different. Um, let's talk about the... the the different uh, benefits and disadvantages that that had. I mean, Malkior, you played a lot of Guild Wars 1. Tell me about the dual class system. Was that a major benefit or a major disadvantage to PvP? Oh, it, it's got its pros and cons for sure. The pros meant you were open to do any number of things that you deemed would allow you to achieve victory. But the cons were 
if a metagame formed, which it did pretty quickly, you're either kind of stuck to that or you got to be the one to branch out and find the next counter or find the next big thing. And with Anet doing consistent skill balances, they used to be monthly and then it was like every other month. Everything's changing, so it's like who can find the next big build quick or something like that. And the key element where it fell apart, having two professions amongst what ended up being a total of, I can't even count now, I think it was as eight professions. No, ten. Ten professions. Ten professions total, two out of any of them. There's thousands of skills to pick. And if you're coming into it fresh, you have no idea what's good and what's not. Oh, so, yeah, so it was difficult yeah. to get in later on. Yes, definitely. Yes, it was. I, I remember playing the like the first Guild Wars. You know, I played it you know pretty regularly, and then you know I stopped for a while, and then I picked up uh, what was it, Nightfall, and then trying to get back into everything, it was just daunting. Even just adding yep. a couple a couple more classes, and now hundreds of more skills, and now there's that many more combos. It was just yeah, overwhelming. Yeah, and Nightfall Nightfall killed new players because it added the concept of heroes. So now you don't only want to know the best bar for your class. You want to know the ne the best bar for your warrior hero, your ranger hero, your monk hero. Was that the equivalent of uh, of that was like AI characters that you would build and have AI them follow you around? You would build within your within skill templates that you could set for them, within armor you give them, within weapons you'd give them, and they could, and you could follow you on like PVE type missions. Yes, basically. and yeah. and they were allowed in some PVP formats after oh, okay. a time. Interesting. Oh wow. Yeah, I think in um, in Guild Wars it followed the same suit as as almost Eve Online in the respect that it started out those that started with it developed as the game went on, and you see this in communities all around. Um, you know, QQ for example, where they where the the respect for the game raises as all of these new complications come up because they followed it since the beginning. Similar to Eve, those who have started Eve from the beginning. Um, have a lot more respect for the game now and are more, uh, not fanboyish, but they're more heartfelt about the game because they fully understand it um, than they are in, let's say, WoW. I mean, and WoW started off simple enough, right? But the, ex the expansions and the changes and the patch changes that came out thereafter, they didn't have massive, change massive changes to the game. I mean, heck, I played a Rogue. The biggest change since the day I played in the original to even now was the vanish ability not requiring powder. I mean, that was the biggest thing. Um, and so so that little level of uh, complexity never went up in WoW. So you, now you have these two very different types of games, and I do include Guild Wars 1 in the EVE uh, category there, where it's so complex for a new player to get in, but those that do take the time to learn it, and I, and I do suggest everybody try to learn Guild Wars 1. It, it's really rewarding. If you take the time to learn it, you'll you'll have so much more of a respect for it than you would, um, you know, WoW, for example. It, it's two very different audiences, but we'll have to see in Guild Wars 2. I mean, in Guild Wars 1, you had s thousands of skills. I mean, are we, are we expecting that in Guild Wars 2 as well? No. 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 At least not on the onset, because that's what they're doing. They're uh, establishing these skills across this certain weapon, and then you only got... 30 or something utility skills for each class that way it's still about the choice of skills that you bring into each encounter but you just don't have as massive of a selection or yeah, as, each, um, each class skills had... overlapping on each other how, how many skills did each class had on average the number that i remember hearing was like a hundred or something and that was close to when the game launched if i recall correctly when the, when, yeah when the game launched we're looking at around maybe oh, anywhere between 80 to 100 per class. Now each class probably has upwards of 250. No, wow, they really added a lot more than I remember. Jeez, and and a lot of those within, with, were with not just trainable, expansion. right? You yeah, have to really each, earn them. I, I might be going, I might be going a little overboard with <laughs> each. Yeah, you guys just heard my door. You can get over that. <laughs> it, all right, so let's say 80 to 100, and then each class got 30 per expansion. 30 to 50 per expansion. In addition to that, in addition to that, the PVE skills came in Eye of the North. 
and those were allowed by every class, the PvE title skills. So let's say probably 30 to 50 title skills were added so you so, could be used in PvE. So it's safe to say that, you know, the the manager of the the well not, not the manager, but the the guy in charge of the balance for the game was is, tearing his hair out. Like he was. The the dual class system was really a fantastic concept sort of it, on paper and when when you hear about it you're like that sounds cool. I'm going to make a warrior monk or I'm going to make an elementalist warrior or whatever because everybody loves hybrid type classes, right? And this yes. is a hybridization engine on steroids. Yes. And then the guy who's in charge of the balance is told, "Yeah, characters can have all of these different combinations, like, what was it? Was it six or eight that came with the original game? I, I think it eight. was eight on the original game. So eight, I don't know the math off the top of my head, eight to the second or something like that. Uh, what? No. Eight times eight, 64 skills on a GBG team? So it, it was just a ridiculous amount of things that even one player could have. And that led to tons of, like, tiny hidden skill interactions that nobody saw coming and then when they got released they just crushed everything i mean yes. freelancer i know that you played a little bit when it came out do you remember a skill by the name of i will avenge you i do not know well let me tell you about this skill and let me let me ask you how you think this might go wrong so this is a skill that the warriors have and it increases i believe your attack speed and attack power or something to that effect basically it increases it's, your attack it, it's your attack speed and your health regeneration and your health regeneration there you go so it increases both of those based upon every teammate that is dead right now what if i were to tell you that when you ha have uh, people that are either rangers in their primary or secondary and they have pets those pets are considered teammates <laughs> can you see where this might go wrong? And then when you come in from PvE, all. you can have a pet as low as level 5 or something, where you're level 20, so it dies instantly. So then you have eight warrior rangers who all have their pets run into combat and die, and then you have that ability, I will avenge you, passively stacking on everyone on the team until they are basically gods chopping through all the mortals with ease. And... And this is a shout skill. So now you're free to use your stance for an increased movement speed. So you're moving and attacking faster, and there is no way in heck they can kite you. And, and that's just one example of the sort of I, ridiculous combinations that you couldn't see coming. See, I feel, like, I feel like when it got to that point where there was that many skills, whoever was doing the balancing was just like, you know what, let's just let them figure out how to break it, <laughs> and then we'll fix it. Because oh no, this, this is back in the beginning of the game. This they didn't yeah. even have time yet. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, with the whole, with, I'm, I'm really glad that they got rid of the, that whole two profession system because, you know, it was good in a sense that it's like, oh man, look at all the options I get. But in another way, it was that, you know, for people who are lazy like myself, I go and I look to see, oh, what's the strongest build right now? Flavor I have, of the month, exactly. I have, I have 400 skills to choose from. I don't feel like really messing with them right now. I'm going into PvP. I want to get in there. Let me just go see what the best build order, not build order, the best <laughs> skill build skill build is, and I'll just do that. So, you know, in, in one way it was good for people that who like to experiment, but in another way it was, you know, it kind of took away from the game. I gotta there, say, probably, uh, there were probably dozens of skills that were really just useless that no one really ever used. Yes. Until you find the one way that they become way overpowered in some situation. Go ahead, Freelancer. I was going to say a uh, quick note. I logged into my Guild Wars 1 account after seeing the show notes here, and I got my assassin, and he had a Sira scan on his, on his bar, and I, I hadn't played in five months getting my HOM reward. So I go to do my normal setup with it the Sira scan. Exactly. It and see, normally a Sira scan did this huge damage increase. So my setup was like one, a Sira scan, two, uh, Wasslers or whatever you call it, where you teleport in. And uh, then I would do... Uh, you know, Ox and all these other ones. Well, I start teleporting in, and I'm noticing, man, my damage is crap. And uh, they changed the, the skill just completely without even letting, well, you know, I didn't really keep up. But was, so I start dying over and over. I have no idea what's going on. And I'm like, you know what? I hate this game. <laughs> and I rage quit right there. But it turns out... Yeah, it turns out they changed it from a completely, like, all right, it was like a total damage increase, like a 50% or more, depending on your title track. Which is crazy um, when you're hitting twice as an assassin. Yeah, so 
you cast it and you do an insane amount of damage. But then they changed it completely to a different mechanic. Now it's like for the next five attacks, you you never miss. Like it has nothing to do with what it used to be, and it, it just threw me completely off guard. It was great though. I had. A... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about the the PVE system and sort of how the PVE changed over time. Because again, I wasn't there, so I'm going to ask Mal Malkier. Um, when Guild Wars 1 came out, what was the PvE like? I know it had a very interesting narrative mission system where there was a lot of heavy scripting that provided, you know, a lot more than you find in a Guild Wars quest, uh, sorry, in a, in a World of Warcraft quest, for example. Oh, yeah. There were the traditional quests, and you could go out and handle those, get experience in gold, and some of them, this is how they utilize their skill system within the PvE environment. A majority of the quests through the Prophecies campaign actually unlocked skills. I remember and that. So, That's right. I just started playing again recently, and I saw as a quest reward I got a skill. Not, and now, with those things, if you miss that quest, can you still get that at a trainer? Yes. Um, at a so later that was just town, basically giving you gold. <laughs> possibly have that skill. Yeah, it's like, if you're going to do the quest for it, why pay money? There you go. So... Mm -hmm. And then as you advance through the campaign, Prophecies was set on a kind of a distance leveling curve so it could set out the storyline. And so you're moving through each area. Then you get to this area called the Crystal Desert. And by now, you're either level 20 or you're close to level 20, which is max for Guild Wars. And then you get introduced to each of these. You get introduced to three missions for your Ascension Quest. And each mission is actually a training ground for PvP. As you as you find as if you've discovered by playing enough Guild Wars or by playing in the PvP, the entire PvE campaign is teaching you tactics. Whether it be use this skill, this is a condition removal. Use this skill, this is a hex removal. It's teaching you build tactics, and it's teaching you gameplay tactics to play PvP at a high level. So then you come to the Crystal Desert, and the three missions are. The three most common PvP game types. There's King of the Hill at the Dunes of Despair. There's uh, Relic Run, which is, in this sense, it was get the three um, pieces of the Vision Crystal to put it back together at Alona Reach. And then at Thirsty River, you had a Team Annihilation Death Match where every two minutes the all the enemies would respond via a priest. So you had to time your kills, run in and kill the priest, and be able to do all this within a reasonable amount of time. So then, basically, the PvE, despite looking like sort of a traditional RPG in its aspects, you know, there's a major story element that pushes the story forward, and you complete that, and then before you can complete the next major story element, you have to go sort of do all these mini quests for all the areas around there in order to level up. And then when you level up, you can push forward on the mainer story. I mean, that kind of reminds me of a Final Fantasy-style RPG uh, to some extent. And that actually made it so that it had a story that was really interesting and, and, you, and you could actually follow. Whereas, like, the World of Warcraft story, I leveled up. I, I, most of the time, I didn't know what the heck was going on. I know there's bad <laughs> goblins over there, and I should probably kill them, or quillbores or something, and they're encroaching, so therefore they must die. But that's about the long and the short of it. This one had a real story, and I thought that was a major sort of improvement at the time. But uh, you're saying it was all just a tutorial. It, it had the story, and the story is there, so it can be a PvE game for those who want it to be. But for those who are eight, looking to ascend to the next level, because you're level 20, you finish the PvE story campaign, that's it. Besides that, there were two elite areas in Guild Wars, and they were determined by world favor, which we'll get into that a little bit later. So you had one choice. Go PvP or make another character. So then, Which lots of people made a whole bunch more characters, because the max level was 20. So only playing one class or one class combination left you so much more to build on and then as you get more skills into your repertoire you can be a better player in PvE or PvP so the first game they touted the fact that it was PvE and PvP but you think that really they were pushing the PvP more than the PvE they were just by basically what was in the actual game they were they no they were 
during the prophecy's onset, they were pushing both kind of equally. It was beyond that that the game took a PvE term with factions and Nightfall. Uh, factions, the leveling curve was set much quicker. You can get through the tutorial island within several hours and be level 16 compared to spending several days upwards to a week in prophecies to get level 20. And if you really know what you're doing, you can max level in factions in one day, easily. So, the fact that they had such a really large PvP focus does, I mean, in some ways bode well for, for Guild Wars 2, because obviously we've seen that they've got a large PvP focus for Guild Wars 2, with the various different types. You've got World versus World, and the competitive, and the fact that you can have sort of casual version of competitive with the, you know, hot droppable, hot, hot joinable PvP and things like that. So it seems like they're continuing with that tradition of a strong PvP focus, and not having it be something that was just tacked on secondarily, basically. Which is Oh, good. yes. Oh, yes. There's even lore within their PvP, if you know where to look hard enough. Very interesting. And and the lore in, the, in, in this game is fantastic, and we're going to spend a whole other episode on it. We're going to get some experts on it, because, again, I didn't play it enough. But we're, we're, we're going to try and get some, some people that really know what they're talking about to come on and, and school us about the, about the lore of, of Guild Wars. Um, but I should point out that uh, I'm going to probably be reading the first book in sort of the... Uh, prequel series of Guild Wars 2 called Ghosts of Ascalon. And I've heard it, you know, I've heard some good things on it. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a terrible book, and it gives you sort of the, the background to the Destiny's Edge um, group that you'll be playing with a lot in the Guild Wars 2 story. So we'll talk about that at some time in the future. So if anybody, you know, wants to be a part of that, wants to listen to that show and not have a lot of spoilers, I'm just giving you a heads up. You should probably go out and try and grab it or put it on your Christmas list or something like that. And uh, we'll talk about it sometime in you know a month or so uh, when we get to the lore episode. We'll see. Um, okay. <clears throat> that, that having been said, um, let's talk about the PvP. Uh, Freelancer, did you PvP at all in Guild Wars 2? Uh... Or Guild Wars 1? <laughs> just, en just enough to get some Zaishin keys so I could get my HOM rewards, but um, as far as GVG and stuff, I did not have uh, the pleasure to do that, no. I spent most of my PvPing time in other MMOs. Vega? Um, I had a little bit. Um, the guild I was part of, we did a few GVGs and stuff, and it was a lot of fun. That was the main reason why I, I, I played it was, I mean, th there was no real end game in Guild Wars. Like, most of my all my playing in Guild Wars was just prophecies. I, I had Nightfall, but I really didn't play it. But, I mean, I, I had maybe three or four characters that were, you know, level 20 because it was so easy to get there. And you get there, and it, you, the only thing to do was PvP, and that's what you did. Um, so I had a lot of uh, a lot of fun with that, I remember. But I, don't, I couldn't tell you too many specifics. <laughs> All right. So... Talk to us then, Malkira, because I didn't play, but I did spectate a little bit um, when they rolled out the spectating feature. Uh, tell us, what was the main guild versus guild battle mode in Guild Wars 1? Because I understand it's quite different from what it is in Guild Wars 2. Oh, yeah. GVG, guild versus guild, guild Wars 1, is this 8 on 8 attack and defend kind of mode concept deal. There's a flag stand in the middle where you take your flag, and if you hold that for two minutes, you get a morale boost. That's a 10% increase. So you take your flag from your base and try to put it on the flag stand, and then you yes. get a sort of stat boost for your whole team. If, if you hold it long enough, the enemy can put their flag in that stand, which will then respawn yours back at your base, and then you got to start over from scratch. So it's, so it's got a king of the hill mode sort of in the center of the map going on, yes. but it's got other things going around on the outside. Yes. So if you hold the flag stand for two minutes, you get a 10% increase to your health and morale, making you a little beefier. But it doesn't improve your damage at all. That, that's one of the key elements. It doesn't matter how weak you are, you are still dangerous if you can get your damage out. That allowed for many crazy comebacks. And so with this, in the original mode of Guild Wars 1, the whole of, and still now, the whole objective is to kill the enemy's guild lord. Generally, you do this by going to the flag stand, maybe pressuring the enemy flag runner, getting um, a morale boost or two to gain an edge on the opponent, getting some kills, 
and then when you've got them outnumbered, you can push them back to their base. Once in their base, you proceed to kill their NPCs or... So there were NPCs on their oops. side of the map guarding, and you had to sort of take them down, almost like the towers in Dota. When you take them down, they don't respawn? Yes. Yes, there's um, like two guild keeps, and there's archers, knights, bodyguards, and the guild lord for each side. And, uh, each NPC has its own worth. There's archers posted generally outside of, or on the towers of each keep. That way they can cripple anyone who tries to come in. So any solo person who tries to do a gank play or anything like that is going to be hindered if they don't dodge that crippling shot. Okay, so there was a lot of um, – now, was there a major respawn timer on there so that, you know, if you managed to kill a couple members on the enemy team, you'd have a small power play for a while? Two minutes. Uh, two respawn minutes? Respawn time, respawn timers every two minutes, ah. and one of, the, one of the key points was if you can get them in a position right before that timer, save them for a bit and kill them after time. That way they're down for one player for two whole minutes. Ah, Okay. That's, uh, that sounds like a really cool system. So then the goal, of course, was to kill the enemy keep lord, um, uh, yes. or guild lord. So you, you, you know, both sides are pushing back and forth, killing NPCs when they can. And uh, I heard that there was a problem with this originally. The games managed to last quite a long time. Yes. Um, during the early phases, I believe later beta and early release, there was no end game to the GVG. It just went until one team killed the other team's guild lord. Well, these teams will get locked in this stalemate in the middle, and no one side could gain an advantage. And there's this iconic match that happened on the... God, if I can't pull the name of the guild hall up, I'm going to be embarrassed. But it's the desert one. The... God bless America, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not important. Nobody else is going to care about the name <laughs> anyway. I am. Put, <laughs> it's a personal gonna... victory, damn it. <laughs> yes, it is. And I'm going to so, it real quick while I'm so, talking. Wait, anyway, quick, is it quicksand? So, quicksand? Yeah, yeah it's quicksand. Ah, but... thank you, Edwin Shep from... No, Edwin I know, Shep. but there's a name for it. It's oh. the... Nomad's Isle. Nomad's yeah. Isle. There we go. Okay. Okay. I'll, <laughs> so it's now, on the Nomad's without... Isle, and it's in this, it's in this quicksand. So both teams are finding it hard to move. And when you're in the quicksand, you lose an energy every time you use a skill. So one team can never get an advantage on the other. And this match went for like one and a half hours before one side <laughs> finally won. So that's that's obviously a big problem. Now, did players identify that as a major problem right away? Did ArenaNet fix it? Uh, some players enjoyed, like, the battle of attrition that they were having, but most others thought it was just a bore fest, and let's end it. So, ArenaNet introduced the victory or death concept, and this has... I like both... the sound of that, yeah. 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 <laughs> let's do it. Let's, let's just get on with it. <laughs> so, now, at a certain point in the match, and this changed through several updates originally it was like 35 minutes at 30 minutes victory or death starts and everyone players and npcs get this buff called victory or death which allows you to do 10 percent more damage but then you also take 10 percent more damage now you hit harder but you can also be hit harder and so with that the monks couldn't really keep up with the protection and the healing or they do it so much that they burn out of their energy. At 32 minutes, the NPCs from either side would march out for this big confrontation in the middle. We got like eight NPCs on this side, eight NPCs on this side, and then eight players apiece. That's a 16, 16, 32, just big ball of boom in the middle. And then with that, if it wasn't over yet, or one team couldn't gain advantage to push. At 35 minutes, the two guild lords come marching out to meet for the for the for the, the objectives. Final leave their protected home they and leave, march towards well, the enemy. It's not so protected anymore. It's not <laughs> so protected true. anymore. Besides the fact that it's in the back, there's no NPCs. That's true. So the guild lords come out for for a final battle. But during that time that it was unprotected, it did open some strategies because now. The guild lords are alone. The NPCs are here. You could send a split team to go around and kill the guild lord if you can snare the mid team enough before they get back. A lot of intricacies opened up with this victory or death and forced players to think about where they were going with their strategies. It's like, okay, are we designed to kill them here at the stand and gain a morale boost so we can push? 
or do we develop this split strategy where we're just killing off their NPC so we have an advantage for the victory or death component? But then we have a situation where, again, the massive number of skills in the game come, comes and rears its ugly head because a skill that had been thought meaningless and useless for PvP yes. starts yes. to be used by some, by some of the guilds uh, specifically to kill NPCs that don't know how to dodge it. Yes, this came in the Guild Wars Factions Championship. It first showed its ugly head with Idiot Savants versus Irresistible Blokes, match one of the quarterfinals. See, back then we had these big championships for Guild Wars, but them, them cost money, so we don't have that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so IQ um, had been basically brought back into their base by IB, and... IB's got this super crazy degen build, and IQ just can't hold up. Luckily enough, they got two heal parties so they can stay alive, but they just can't do anything to IB. So for the last, like, ten minutes of the game, they're just kind of turtling in their base, trying to pick kills where they can, and saving their NPCs. Victor of Death comes in at 30 minutes. Both teams march out with their NPCs to the middle. And IQ reveals something they've been saving for 30 minutes that entire game their elementalist pulls out glyph of sacrifice which allows your next cast to cast instantly even though it then tacks on like a minute to its recharge timer <laughs> and then but you only need one because all the damage you is only boosted. need one that's the key point point. and <laughs> meteor shower which is channeled for nine seconds doing damage every three seconds and knock down each one of those seconds so then he does this glyphosac meteor shower on the ball of NPCs, and at this ball time, IB NPCs. is, IB, yeah, Irresistible Blokes is standing right there with their NPCs, because they don't know what's coming. They get hit with the meteor shower. Their entire team is knocked down from anywhere from six to nine seconds, and they just explode. And, and, and this is normally wasn't a problem in PvP because it's easily dodgeable, but because yeah, they combined it with the fast glyph, yeah, you see it coming. Yeah, but but, but they combined it with that glyph, and that they, made they, it work. They didn't use it the entire match. They saved it for that one. <laughs> First minutes, Sneaky they did bastards. not use that skill. They saved it. He's using six skills. And they're thinking, um, what's the last two? He must have a res signet to bring a per teammate back up. He must have some other support skill that he's not using because he's stupid or something. <laughs> and then he drops the meteor shower, and they're just like, what the heck just happened? And this kills basically all of their NPCs? Yes, this kills all their NPCs. So now um, Idiot Savants, the American team, has the advantage, and they just beat out um, the European team, Irresistible Blokes, through numbers. And that became such a powerful tactic that even that, if you knew it was that, coming, you couldn't make your NPCs that, move out of the way. No, they see, for, and everyone else is like, okay, they they probably considered it a fluke. This was in the quarterfinals, the semifinals against Evil, the um the Last Pride, the number one team in the world. Evil is designed to like split up and just divide and conquer and tear your team apart from the inside. They got these two assassins that can like re um, teleport into your base and then teleport right back out. So if you go to push into the base, they're just going to go out and get a flag advantage. Or if you um, try to get them on the outside, they'll go in and get your NPCs. It's all about controlling the battle the way they want. Game 2 versus Evil. Idiot Savants literally... No, no, Game 3 versus Evil. Idiot Savants literally walked outside, saw evil coming, turned back around <laughs> in their base for the entire 30 minutes. Which means they could and, basically channel anytime evil came in, they had to come in through, what, two and, two possible openings and, and that's it? And then, well, no, they just stayed right here in the, in the Lord pit. And oh, so okay. evil had to push in. And evil has this build that's designed to pick away at individual targets or to split. It's not designed for this 8v8 fight. So they just kind of troll a la 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 for 30 minutes. <laughs> and then IQ pushes out with their NPCs. Um, Evil falls back so they can get their NPCs. And then they just do the big fight at the stand. Meteor Shower comes down. It's not as decisive as the Irresistible Blokes match, but 
with all that meteor shower, with all that fire damage, with the spiritual pain and the AoE damage, evil split team just couldn't keep up, and they got the best monks in the world. They burned them out on their energy, and with all eight of evil's players still alive, IQ killed the guild lord. Oh, evil wow. just ran out of energy. Wow. So that's uh that's a very interesting so that that was how how long after the game came out did that was that was that six or eight or ten months after it came out this was the good words factions championship oh it's factions so yeah and i think factions came out six or eight months after the original game so it was probably like a year or a year and a half something like that yeah we're looking at a year and two to three months because this was in august gotcha gotcha okay so that Give us a good uh, background as to what, you know, the major PvP things. I mean, after this, I assume they changed some more stuff, but we don't need to go into all of the details. But there was metagame, you know, this sort of flavor of the month battles, sort of like that, where somebody discovers overpowered thing X, and then ArenaNet probably does something to make overpowered thing X weaker, and then somebody just finds the next yes. most overpowered thing. Yes, I kinda... and, and, and it, at times it was more balanced than others, and... But seriously, this wasn't really a case of overpowered thing X. It was we figured out the format. We realized, hey, this VOD thing has to happen. Let's just build for it. Yeah. This wasn't a th this wasn't a case of we figured out the build. It's we figured out the format, and this is the first time truly that people came up with the term build wars because the build, <laughs> the build, not the guild, not the gameplay. IQ had been losing. They gave up all the morale boosts. They gave up their front NPCs. They just had their core pit. They gave up everything. The build won the game, not the skill. And that's when uh, the scene of Guild Wars PvP changed. Okay, so go ahead, Jay. You were saying something? I kind of, well, kind of hearing this because I wasn't this familiar with how much, um, like what kind of... I guess pro level PvP was in Guild Wars 1, but I kind of like where Guild Wars 2 is going then because it sounds like that with the World vs. World, 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 they're going to have a sort of similar system where you have, you know, NPCs and lords and all that stuff. So you have like those big long battles that'll probably appeal to, you know, the pros of Guild Wars 1, but I kind of like where they're going with the PvP of Guild Wars 2 and that it seems to be a little bit shorter, a little bit more. I guess team based as opposed to you know having NPCs running out and go kill the the guild lord and stuff like that. Oh no, it, it, it was team based. Those NPCs didn't come in until at the end, yeah, thirty minutes. Yeah, but but as you people just, saying, just figured it out. That was the yeah, whole deal. Yeah, yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah, I gotta I gotta interject here and kind of change the tempo. Um, if the guild wars, your description of the tournament, that those two particular matches was awesome. Okay, it, it sounds exciting. It sounds like what I watch consistently in StarCraft 2. It's great, but I, I don't know if we are already going to get to this bridge or you'll have to forgive me, but That's if okay. it was so great and if it was so exciting, which it sounds like, what happened? Why, I mean, what happened to that scene? Why did it die? I mean, and, and I guess a valid excuse could be other MMOs if you want to go that route, but I would imagine yeah, something, it. okay, I would imagine something in Guild Wars 1 changed or the community changed to make it yes. just die out so rapidly. What was that? Yes, the, the community did certainly change. Um, throughout, as the time Factions and Nightfall developed, Guild Wars 1 took a more PvE focus. Faction, um, Nightfall was all about heroes and developing these NPC characters, these AI characters that could fight with you and essentially you didn't need a team anymore. You didn't need players. Heroes were even allowed in some formats after a while. When um, Nightfall got on up in years and um, ArenaNet wanted to make some stuff interesting, they allowed heroes in GVG. So you could have a team of two to three people go in with a team of – or no, I think it was four minimum. Four minimum people go in with four heroes. And if you got this stupid, broken kind of meta build – going up against this balance build some heroes did their jobs at pressuring better than a human could because their computer they got that second code it was set that way and in addition with the pvp the whole x beats y got to a crazy level where isaiah basically said 
that's it. I've had enough. He threw up his hands. <laughs> he did. He did. In 2008, August 2008, he throws down these crazy updates that are just, what was he thinking? He takes one of these skills called Smiter's Boon. It used to be five energy. He puts 25 energy on it. That's half of a average caster's full bar. It has a 10-second recharge. He puts a 90-second recharge on it. It's like, nah, I don't like this skill. And then he puts, like, some <laughs> two-second cast timer on it, and then it only lasts eight seconds. He literally burned that skill to the ground. And then throughout the following months, August, September, October, November, different builds came out that were just crazy, stupid, broken. The PvP audience stopped caring. And they left. So... Gotcha. The flavor of the month is great as long as it's changing, but if it's not changing, then, then it gets real boring real fast. And anybody who played um, Rise of Nations, Rise of Legends will know that because every single person played Vinci and used the Vinci uh, tech rush, and it was <laughs> really, really bad. Despite the fact that the other factions in that game were fantastic and awesome, there was just no reason not to use the best thing in the game. So, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's... I'm sorry, let me be my freelancer. Let's change the tempo. Uh, we, <laughs> we want to, um, let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, whether you, uh, w what we thought of Guild Wars 1. Obviously, Malkior enjoyed Guild Wars 1 or he wouldn't have kept playing it. Uh, but uh, what, did, what did you think about it, Jay? Why did you not continue to play it? I know you played it a little bit. What made you stop? I stopped playing it, um, one, because... I, 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 when I, after the game came out, I, that's when I started college, and then I just didn't have time for it, and I just kind of lost, and every time I came back, it was, it was like, uh, and I got to relearn all this stuff, and so much has changed, and, you know, so I, I, that's how I lost that, but then I think another thing, and this is kind of, I guess, small in the grand scheme of things, was I didn't like, um, cosmetically the gear and stuff. I, I, I didn't feel unique. Um, like that was one of my favorite parts of other MMOs is, you know, finding the cool gear and doing something like that. But I felt like there wasn't that much diversity, um, for Guild Wars one. That's just a very minor thing. It doesn't, but I mean, mainly it was that I just kind of, it just wasn't holding me in the game. I just kind of lost interest in it. Yeah. I had, I had the same kind of problem and I can't remember that was, it came out in what? 2005 was when that game yes. came out. Right? April 28, 2005. So, dang, I don't remember, but I assume that there was something else that caught my attention at that point. I know that by <coughs> 2006, at the end of 2006, I was playing Company of Heroes, but I don't remember what the heck I was doing in 2005. I want to say it was um, Battlefield, but I think Battlefield came out a little bit before that. But I know I got heavily into Battlefield 1942 when that came out. And that's usually that's the name of why I don't play things is because I find something else and it's opportunity cost. But there were things – I mean I, I retried getting back into Guild Wars 2. And there's some things that I really liked. The, um, the music is amazing. The visual design and sort of the quality of the visuals in the game, it still kind of blows me away at how good the characters can look. But again, I, I agree with Jay – they look that good because you can only be a couple of them, right? There's not nearly as much choice. I don't think, I think maybe you get to choose of one out of like 10 different heads and that's it, if I recall correctly. There wasn't much choice at all, and which is way different than Guild Wars 2 where you have these massive, massive changes yeah. you can make to the, it's like the Skyrim thing where you change the jaw, do you want a cleft? How deep do you want it? Do you want it up or down? The mole should be over here, over there. Uh, so... That's, I think, a huge improvement right there. And it also looks, you know, just as good. I, I really like, you know, they've gone for a realistic look in the Guild Wars, the, you know, scene. Sort of, it's, it's not the cartoonish, cel-shaded style look that, uh, you know, War, World of Warcraft has taken. Um, yeah, it, and it's, somehow it's they true to its art aesthetic. Yeah, and somehow yeah. they they managed to get past the, the, the uncanny valley. I mean, the characters in that game looked really good. And they didn't – maybe they weren't quite into the Uncanny Valley. I don't know. The animations were, you know, 2005-ish. But I can't put my finger on it, but I guess I just wasn't interested in hitting the same buttons over and over again after playing World of Warcraft. That's, that's really what it comes down to. I didn't want to play an MMO where you were just 
hitting the same buttons over and over again, doing the same rotation. And that's, in the end, it was what, you know, a lot of what Guild Wars was. It, there was some, when you're playing PvP, obviously, there's a lot more reacting going on. But in PvE, despite the fact that the narrative in the world was a lot more interesting to me than it was World of Warcraft was, I still just, I couldn't get myself to play it. Actually, real quick, there, I think another reason why I stopped was that all my friends stopped playing and my guild kind of disbanded. And that always is the death now, isn't it? When I when I play these types of games, you know, I want to play with my friends, and I, I think at the time everyone was playing World of Warcraft, so I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna go play World of Warcraft, and that didn't last very long at the time. But and then I tried getting back into it in Nightfall, and that's when you know there was all the uh, the sort of like heroes that you're traveling around with, and I just couldn't get back into it. I wonder if that's it. I wonder World of Warcraft came out. What day did that come out? That came out February 11th, 2005. No, sorry, November... That, sorry, that was, that was the EU release. November 23rd, 2004. <laughs> so we were playing... I was playing World of Warcraft, you know, well before Guild Wars. I might have gone back to it. I can't remember. What do you, what do you think? Um, oh, yeah, switch cameras. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, you don't, like, you don't like my face? <laughs> nope. Nope, we're switching <laughs> off. <yeah. laughs> I gotta say, Super, Bridger, if so you pretty. hate... If you hate pressing the same buttons, do not play a mage in raids and WoW. Just whatever oh, you do. Oh, absolutely. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I agree. Stay. It's like arcane missile. So I arcane mean, I don't mind well. pressing the same buttons as long as I'm doing it because I'm making an active choice. I mean, one of the things that gets me excited about Guild Wars 2 is it you seems like... You mean maxing your DPS? No, I mean like reacting to the the different situations that you encounter. If you If you're dropping in... And surprising an elementalist, for example, you're going to want a different weapon, you're going to want a different, you know, sort of play style than you are if a thief surprises you. You're going to have to choose different skills to do different things, and that, you know, I mean, and to some extent that was always true in any of these MMOs, but I feel like Guild Wars 2, it's going to be more true that you're going to really be making more active choices to dynamic situations and having to respond to what's going on and not simply go in with a pre-built, this is what's going to happen and, uh, and I'm, just going to re I'm just going to follow this same game plan the whole time. So, I mean, I always like games that force you to think on your feet is, is really what it comes down to. So, so what class do we think in Guild Wars 2 will have the ever-famous Paladin bubble? <laughs> well, the Guardians already got some. That's what's one of their let's, elites. Let's say it right now. Yeah, go ahead. Let's say it right now for for officiality. Uh, what will be the class? We we're gonna say it before anybody else. What class will have the insane Paladin bubble or well, the equivalent? Well, the oh, you mean the thing that's, that's... of the Paladin bubble came from the fact that he could still move and use spells and stuff. <laughs> The or out. The so you mean the what's the what's the class that's going to be the most OP right at the beginning, basically? Oh, mm. is that oh. your question? I I would easily say the elementalist. I I just have a feeling it's just going to be so. It's going to be so intuitive for somebody to pick up an elementalist and just spam the nuking buttons, you know. And since nobody really knows how to use their conditions and such yet, can you imagine just all that if, person has to do is focus damage, you know? Yeah. If, 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 if people don't move, yes. If, if <laughs> stand if, still so I can shoot you in six shots. I actually think <laughs> that the, the, the class that might be complained about the most is probably long-range hunters with a longbow because yes. they're not going to know enough about the movement capabilities of their character because I know that all characters have some weapon sets that allow them to be more mobile than normal and you know if a They're ranger like can just now. kite them I mean everybody knows about kiting and, and so kiting comes naturally and easily to players so if you know how to kite you can just pick up a longbow and hit people with those long range abilities and if they can't get near you because they don't know how yet that might be the first thing that people just go rangers overpowered I hate this game you know, but you know the people that do you know before trying to figure out their class. So I think Ranger I'm, might be a problem. You've been, pra go. you've been practicing that. <laughs> I've been practicing I'm my go angry with nerd. The underdog, and I'm and that's why nerd. I never play your game again. Okay. <laughs> what were you saying, Jay? I'm gonna go with the engineer, because wow. I remember that's watching one PvP video with the engineer like being extremely mobile and bouncing all over the place, and then pulling out his flamethrower when he gets in close, and then just being a tank. Well, not really a tank, but like putting out a lot of damage. I think he's going to be the, the, he's gonna the, be the sneaky one. He's going to be the sneaky one that no one expects. The I can't wait. Bruiser. 
a bruiser. I can't wait to come to watch somebody in a battleground come around a corner and like five engineers have their guns set up and like they <laughs> just, <laughs> just one shot this guy world, and he world completely world right there. Yeah, and he completely rage quits the whole game. Well, right one, there. Of the things, like... <laughs> one of the things that I read that's become a real interesting thing is if you're an engineer, you can put your thumper turret up, like, on the edge of a rooftop, and people that, go, you know, are below you that go around the corner will get knocked down, and they'll have no idea why. <laughs> they'll yes. just suddenly get knocked back, and they'll go, why can't I go around this corner? <laughs> that, that, that's Guild Wars 1 gold right there. Guild Wars 1 had no Z-axis, so you could literally put a trap on a bridge... And if someone is walking the passage under the bridge, they can trigger the trap. <laughs> That's wow. Awesome. Nice. That's actually Co Company of Heroes had the same problem. The, the game didn't have a Z-axis. And so you would see machine gunners shooting. Like if you have a hill, uh, the machine gunner would be at the bottom of the hill and somebody's above the ridge and they can't see each other. But the machine gunner will shoot through the ground and suppress him at the top of the hill and they can't even see each other. So that's that. I'm glad that they've got the jumping in the game because that indicates that they do in fact have a Z axis, <laughs> which is important. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised. Most of the chat saying that they're gonna go with Guardian. As yeah, being the biggest. Everybody in the chat uh, immediately said Guardian for Paladin Bubble, but I don't. I don't you see know, the Guardian being all that tough. Like, if, if we're if we're talking about general OP, I'm I'm throwing my hand to the Necromancer. Because not only is he going to burn you out with conditions and stuff so you can't hurt him anyway, he's going to be stealing your life at the same time. Yeah, I so think it's he like... might be one of the tricky ones that in the hands of a really good player, a lot of people are going to call him OP. Oh, yeah. that We've seen that. John Peters got a 3v1 and just wrecked their faces. <laughs> I like that. I, I have never seen a life steal in any game whatsoever. Any game. I mean... Uh, not even just MMOs. That was really s so worth it. It, it. They're always underwhelming, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, I could show you some blood spike in Guild Wars One that would make oh, you, you cry. <laughs> <laughs> There's this build that's designed about just being ungodly fast, and the skill recharges in five seconds. So you just spam life steal spells on them, and then once you kill them, since the rest timer's at two minutes, you just go and make a big circle around their shrine so they can't get out, and then pop this one skill called Unholy Feast that steals health from everyone in the area. It's life-stealing, so the protection guy can't really cover it, and boom. <laughs> Guild Wars 1, broke folks. to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Summed up for you. Sounds legit to me. All right. Yep. <clears throat> so, let's, uh, let's sum this up a little bit. What do you guys think is the biggest single difference between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2. I think the Z-axis is probably clearly the winner here, so let's say besides the Z-axis... Besides the open <laughs> world? Besides, besides the fact you can jump. Besides the fact Besi that you can jump. jumping in the open world. <laughs> so you think the open world makes it... is the biggest oh, difference? Oh, defini definitively, yeah. We're, now we're talking about a full MMO. Guild Wars 1, the title always granted to it by uh, the developers was competitive online role-playing game. Ah, because they it didn't want to call it an MMO. It was never called an MMO. The, the places that called it an MMO were the press. It was never called an MMO by... Excuse me. It was never called an MMO by the developers. That's very interesting. Uh, now, I have a link to a very interesting thing, if I can find it here, where there's a, there's a talk that actually happened at PAX East that I have a, a YouTube video of. Um, they suggested, oh, I need to find the link, because it was like, World of Warcraft isn't really an MMO either. It's a massively linear uh, instance something or other. Let me find it here. Uh, let me just well, was, ask, it the PAX East? was it the panel? It was it was a Paxi's panel, yeah. Let me look it up. Meanwhile, Jay, what do you think the biggest yeah, difference between that. these are? Uh, Guild Wars One um, and Guild Wars Two. Well, besides the open world, I to me the um, I guess the whole positional based combat in that. I I always go back to this. I think every single episode I've said something about the fact that you can dodge and you could you know. Where you where where you are in the field in reference to your team and the opponents plays a huge role 
in the effectiveness of your combat. And to me, that and that that speaks so much in terms of what could be done both in PvP and PvE. It's so fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So I think I think Actually, that'll play that'll be a I feel like that'll be a huge role. Um and that's something that really hasn't been done um to this extent before in other MMOs and I think that really is going to set Guild Wars 2 apart. Excuse me. You know, I think this question is really really important because how many people in chat listening to this podcast, etc., um have friends and you go up to these friends, right? And you're like uh, yeah, I'm getting into Guild Wars. Like they're talking about Star Wars, obviously. You know, whose friend is not talking about Star Wars? And they're you're just casually bringing up Guild Wars Two, right? And you're like, well, I can't wait for Guild Wars Two. And they're like, they're either A, what's that? <laughs> B, <laughs> B, I never played Guild Wars One. Or C, I didn't really like Guild Wars One. So, eh. what about Star Wars? You know, and, freelancer, um, are you spying on me? <laughs> and, How did you know? I, I know everybody has those friends that are either talking about Star Wars or they don't like Guild Wars 1. So I wanted to pose this question to you, Malkir. I want to, I want to put you on the spot. If I am that friend um, and I am saying, you know, but Star Wars has all this great stuff and, you, you, it's, yeah, it plays a little like WoW, but, you know, it's Star Wars. Oh, my God. You know? um, <laughs> oh, and, yeah. and I want you to convince me and let's – it might be impossible, but in like, I don't know, three sentences or uh, less than five minutes – on why I should check out Guild Wars 2 over the silly Star Wars and everything else, or the new WoW, you know, MMO, what would you say? Fuck pandas. <laughs> that, that, that's amazing. But first Sorry, off, did I say that? First off, I'd say if you like money, it's got no monthly fee, so why do you, should you have to pay for something you already own? Two, it's got a brand new style of combat, completely revolutionary, where you can move while using your spells and has got that dodging it's still a persistent open world mmo like everyone knows and loves but it does not require level grind it's all about skill based gameplay the level curve plateaus out so the time to get from 70, 79 to 80 is going to be the same time it took you to get from maybe 19 to 20 that way you're not spending three months, whatever, just to get one character to max level where you can enjoy the actual game. I'm at end game. I can raid. Woo! <laughs> and, no. and you got these dynamic events so that what you do in the world actually affects it and that you are the one... Okay, sorry. I got a little carried away. Like he said. <clears throat> you know what they respond with? I, I go down this route you know, at least once a day, and you know what they respond with each time? I didn't like Guild Wars 1, so what makes, me, what makes you think I'm going to like Guild Wars 2? And that is a problem with... It has to overcome NC, that. That's a problem with NCSoft's marketing. NCSoft is heavily reliant on word of mouth with their marketing. They were like that with Guild Wars 1. Guild Wars 1 had they limited marketing. They need to put that manifesto I would, I would, everywhere. I tell you what, because that yes. sold me on the game more than anything else that has ever been out there. That manifesto yes. video, that needs to be... That you need to use that as an advertisement on YouTube videos. One of those things where it's like, <laughs> you can skip this if you want, but otherwise you should watch the whole thing. Like, that should be all over YouTube as an ad. I, I think, agree. I, I think if someone says that I didn't like Guild Wars 1, why would I like Guild Wars 2? And then you should say that's exactly why you should like Guild Wars 2 is because it's not it's Guild not Wars, like 1. Wars 1. <laughs> it's, it's called, it's called <laughs> Guild it's Wars 2. Game, but literally. It's, you know, the it's only reason it's different. called Guild Wars 2 is because it's from the same development studio and it's using the same lore. I, I feel try, like to look, try to look for any semblance in mechanics. You won't find many. No, it's not the same. I feel like a lot of people get confused and realize and just think it's an expansion or something that it's a big expansion. They don't they don't know that it's a whole new game. That's <laughs> yeah. that's the it's not it's not just Guild Wars one, but in high definition. Yeah, and that's no, kind I, of what I, it implies when you say Guild Wars two. Unfortunately, that's the, 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 that's Guild Wars market. new right there. Guild Wars new. <laughs> yes, yeah, so best of all, no panda people. Thank you. There Jesus. you go. Oh. So. I found what I was looking for here, and these guys, this is a panel at PAX East, and I think they've done it other places as well, but this is the one where it was taken, and I'll put a link in the show notes for you guys. Um, the first part of this panel is called MMOs Are Anything But, and he tries to explain why no MMOs that we think of as MMOs are actually massively multiplayer online role-playing games, and this is what he calls World of Warcraft. Let me see if I have the right spot Back here. In. We would, just not today. I'm only arguing that it isn't what it says it is, that the word MMO 
is not really a useful term anymore. So massively multiplayer online role-playing game. We call this a genre, yet isn't it just a list of mechanics? I mean, we say things like first-person shooter, third-person platformer, RPG. We have everything we use to describe games. It's usually a list of mechanics that the games involve. Sometimes they're fundamental mechanics. But yet, if we really look at this, WoW is more of a massively parallel multiplayer graphical proprietary client several stateful character progressing space with instantiated stateless real-time action management gameplay and statically interactive linear world narrative. Doesn't quite roll off the top. <laughs> so clearly we're not actually listing all the core mechanics of a game. So <laughs> I thought that, that was, was a good one. That was a brilliant. Let me see if I can find the spot. Massively you're, you're... I, I know, the bird that just wants to be part Your of the Your bird podcast. is a thief and he's going to backstab you soon. You better feed him. She's got food. Massively parallel, multiplayer, graphical, proprietary, client server, stateful character progression space with instantiated, stateless, real-time action management gameplay and stati statically interactive linear world narrative. I like the massively parallel because that's what World of Warcraft really was. That. Massive world, massively parallel is really what it should be called. Not massively multiplayer, but massively parallel multiplayer because you didn't play with a ton of people. You played with a small group of people in a world where other people were, but you only ever saw a tiny few of them at any given moment. So Also, you're competing with said people for resources, so you're not really working with them. Right. All right, anyway, th that's, that's a very interesting panel, and I highly recommend you guys check it out. But before the bird goes nuts and breaks out of the cage to end the show, she's right. It is a bit over the time limit here, so I think we're going we're gonna to close this out. Let me just remind you guys, though, the website, talesoftyria.com. Check it out. We're going to have another article up there, hopefully, this week, if I can get off my lazy ass and do it. YouTube channel is at the Sound Strategy Network. Do a search for Sound Strategy Network on YouTube. You'll find it there. Uh, and if you're not listening to the audio show, you can subscribe at the uh, at the website as well and put it on your podcast uh, player of choice. I would like to thank Doug, Michael, Joel, and Daniel for donating to help us uh, keep the podcast going and uh, pay for the, the website and the hosting of all the, the audio shows and things like that. Also, check out TeamLegacy.com. Uh, th sorry, net. Te net, net. I was going to correct it. Why didn't you get I, .com? You I hate got you for com. life. Forever and ever. <laughs> you should have got .com. It's not my fault. Everybody, all the cool kids have .com. Uh, although, I know you did have .net before it was cool, so that's okay, because it's not cool yet. <laughs> anyway, TeamLegacy.net is uh, where you can find some great discussion from the Team Legacy guys. Freelancer and I are always there. Great and Aku have also joined us. So, uh, good, to, uh, good to hang out there. I post... Uh, the weekly show there as well and we discuss a lot of stuff that's going on one of the things i posted there recently is is you know a very interesting link to a gdc post that uh, basically had the blizzard producer describing what makes an esport so check out that thread on teamlegacy.net in the general guild wars 2 discussion have a great night everybody bridge is signing off bye everyone thanks for coming and then the background bird shuts and up. And the background bird. Shh. <laughs> <laughs>